years ago. I was in uh, Michoacan in Mexico, riding on a bus, and uh, happened to be Day of the Dead. And the bus went right past uh, and through Pátzcuaro in Michoacan. Pátzcuaro is uh, a town around, it's next to this beautiful volcanic lake, and all around the lake live the Purépecha Native Americans, Native Mexicans. And uh, uh, that lake uh, and that uh, town, that's Day of the Dead headquarters. That's where it all got going, was in that uh, native, native village. This tradition, as, it we, as we practice it here, got started in that, that part of the country. And I was so blown away by uh, seeing hundreds and hundreds of people in the cemetery of Pátzcuaro uh, with bonfires burning in front of the graves and they were partying hardy. As I recall, uh, it was late at night as the bus passed through and uh, wow, what a scene. Flames and embers going up into the air and uh, joy, life, a lot of life in that cemetery, a lot of life. I don't believe in death. There is no such thing. <laughs> Subjectively, that is. And this, I think, is an important thing to think about. I'm just going to share with you how I, how I look at this subject. See what you think. We'll have a discussion as we mill around and look at our, our uh, ofrendas after worship. We can have discussions about this. I'll just give you my own point of view, having been there for uh, the deaths at the time of, of a number of people in my career. Um, and what I've heard from uh, many reports from people around the world, actually, um, about uh, near-death experiences. Uh, and one of the very many serendipities of my serendipitous life I got to know a guy by the name of uh, Mike Murphy, who's the founder of Esalen Institute up on the uh, California coast. It's sort of the headquarters of the human potential movement. Really interesting guy. And the, the way I got to know him is he happened to live next door to the church I was serving in Sausalito. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway, we became very friendly. Uh, and it, I wound up uh, having uh, a hosting a series of meetings that Mike was holding for a, a group of scholars who were coming up with an encyclopedic account of near-death experiences. And generally, the topic of survival of bodily death is what they were focusing on. Fascinating, these stories, of course. And so many of them are very positive. You know, people that almost died and then snapped back. Mostly, almost all of them are very positive experiences. And all this has, you know, over the years got me thinking about this topic and realizing that, you know, for, for me, when my time comes, I will never know that I'm dead. Because when you're dead, you don't know that you're dead, right? <laughs> so that's just not something I'm going to get to experience. I will not experience death, being dead, right? Now the run up to it, sure, but the actual death, I will not know. So for me, there is no such thing. I don't believe in it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's a subjective thing that we use the term for, you know. There's medical definition of it that's pretty solid. But in the run-up to it, you know, if I think for a lot of, for some people, not everybody, but for some people, there will be a period when all your, sens all your sensory input stops, right? You stop receiving input from the world. And you're in a dream state, a kind of dream state. And because you're not receiving input from the world that would tell you what time it is, 
you have stepped, you are out of time. You have exited from the realm of time. And so for a few seconds, minutes, however long, you're in eternity, experiencing eternal life. So that I believe, even though I'm a, you know, a pretty whatever, this kind of guy about this kind of thing, I'm not a woo-woo person in case you haven't figured that out. Um, but I do believe that there is a subjective heaven. There is a subjective realm that we enter of eternal life. And that we enter that, we can enter that um, in our last moments. But we don't know that there are last moments. We just know that we're in it. And people who have had these experiences report them as a kind of an, a, a, an experience of subjective eternity. Subjective meaning something you experience, rather, you know, you experience, your experience, what's going on in your mind and your soul and your heart, as opposed to what other people see. So, I am a firm believer in subjective heaven. Yes, I believe it. And uh, I believe that uh, the, the task before us is to make that as good as we can by cultivating our imaginations, by, by uh, nurturing and, be, you know, helping our imaginations thrive in a positive way, that we imagine good things. We imagine good things for ourselves and for other people. We imagine a good future. Uh, we just have fun imagining, period. Imagining goodness and joy and creativity and beauty. So to, to get ready for a, good, for a good heaven, right? For a good um, final experience of eternity, to get ready for a good eternal life, <laughs> we need to cultivate our imaginations. Cultivate our positive imaginations. And, and guess what? That's a really good recipe for living, period, anyway, right? It's good for living all the time. What's good for uh, developing a, a, a wonderful um, experience of eternity at the end is also good for us now. Cultivating our imaginations of a better world, especially today, right? especially in the next few days. Imagining the kind of world we want to live in and then making it, right? Doing something with our votes and our activism, making it happen. Um, in the Bible, you know, it's kind of complicated, this whole subject about heaven and the afterlife, etc., because there's no fixed ideas about that. It's mushy. There are different versions of what happens after death in the Bible, right? It's not consistent at all, uh, which keeps it interesting. Um, in the book of Revelation, that really weird document at the end of the Bible, there's a vision of heaven. Chapter 22, it's pretty great, 21 and 22. And the, the heaven that's described, the kingdom of heaven that is described, is on earth, right? It comes out of the sky, out of the highest heaven, and descends and lands on the earth. And what is it? It's a beautiful city. Beautiful city with 12 entryways, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, but also representing all the peoples and tribes and cultures of the world. And people come and go. There's no border patrol, no migra, right? You walk in, you walk out, uh, the doors are open, it's gorgeous, all the doorways, the passageways are beautiful, the city is beautiful. Um, yes, here's, some, here's what it says. I, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God and the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, 
and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut by day, and there shall be no night there. They'll, they shall bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. It's international. It's not heaven is only for heaven people. You know? It's not a Christian nationalist city at all. It's multicultural, international. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the, of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship, worship and see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. The night shall be no more. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Ooh. Sound good? So you got really nice city planning here, right? There's a river runs right through the center of the city. Anybody ever been to Chico, California? Do we have anybody here from Cerveza State? No? That's the nickname. Um, a lot of beer gets drunk there. Anyway, Chico is magical because it has a, it's, it's just like this. It's a, a city that has a river that runs snakes right through the very center of this beautiful town. It's gorgeous. So imagine that, a city that has a river running right through the middle of it, and there's trees, and you can eat, and it's everything, all the beauty of the city is public. It's public goods. It's not private. You don't have to pay to go see the beautiful stuff. It's just there. So you guys, you kids, I want you to, here's my assignment to you. I have an assignment for you guys, and that is to draw the perfect city. When you're doodling, like you're bored at school, like when, you're, when you, you've already aced all your classes and you're good, you don't have to worry, and then you're, you're bored, so you start doodling. I challenge you to doodle an Im images of the perfect, be most beautiful city that you can imagine, right? That's what this, this passage, it's really cool. It's like, this, this is, you know, was it written by a city planner? You gotta wonder, you know? Wouldn't it be great if the city of Simi Valley had a planner who uh, was following this uh, model of how to, how to, how to make a beautiful city? It's, it's, it's awesome. And it's on earth, right? And it's earthy, right? Um, yeah, no dark alleys where bad things happen. Light everywhere. And the other thing is, there's no temple. There's no religion there. Isn't, huh? She doesn't like it. Yeah. No religion. The whole, there's no separate religion. Just life is religion, right? Nor, you know, walking around, being there is all the religion you need, right? There's no temple. The whole city is like a temple, right? Uh, it, it, I just, I just uh, write a book about the Comanche Indians, Native Americans. Whoa, don't mess with Comanches. Wow. Anyway, uh, pretty intense story about the Wild West. But at the end, Quanah Parker, who was the leader of the Comanches, um, settled down on the reservation and uh, got into uh, uh, Native American religion in a deep way. And he said this, he said, the white man goes to his church and talks about Jesus. He says, but the Native American goes into his teepee and talks to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. That's what was going on here, right, in this city. So what you got here is a vision, a beautiful vision. It's what you have here is the cultivation of imagination, right? 
So imagine this kind of heaven on earth place and start to live into that imagination and work toward it. What, what's going to bring us closer to this? You know, what kind of public policies, which politicians are going to bring us closer to this? Let that, let, let Revelations 21 and 22 guide your hand to write, uh, to mark your ballot, right? Let this be your guide. This is your, uh, this is your voter guide. Your voter guide right here. This is your voter guide right here. Uh, so yeah, if we cultivate our imaginations for this kind of heaven in our subjective experience and in our, as close as we can approximate it, in our real world, in the real world around us, then we are, um, we're getting ready. We're making ourselves ready for a terrific eternal life and a terrific and better and better present life. St. Paul, Corinthians, he says, he says this, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is risen, written, this is from Hosea, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? If we have cultivated our imaginations, then there's no sting. The sting is taken away. And if we have cultivated our imaginations, we're also making ourselves receptive to visitations from those who have passed. Visitations in our dreams and even in waking moments when we have a flash of recognition and a sense of presence of those who have passed on before us. Uh, I'm sure uh, all of you at some point have had that experience. That is something to nourish, something to lift up, something to share, something to cultivate. Uh, because when we do that, we are allowing the lives of those who have passed to flow through us in our lives and come to life in our imaginations, our thoughts and experiences. And that, that is eternal life. Happy Day of the Dead to us all, and may we uh, prepare for a wonderful uh, subjective eternity in the now. Amen.